Hi everybody, happy Wednesday. Look, I got clicker in hand. I got my old hat on. Dog trainer, not old hat, I still train dogs. But anyway, welcome to the Dog is Good Lifestyle Show. And today you're in for a treat. We're gonna do something a little bit different because um, this is Train Your Dog Month. And um, we thought what better way to talk about our pups and training than to just have a conversation around that. So, I am gonna ask you right out of the gate, go ahead and share this with your friends. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Gila Kurtz. I'm one of the co-founders and co-owners of Dog Is Good, which is a lifestyle brand for dog lovers. And we'll do a little zoom through our lobby here in just a second to show you kind of what we're all about before the end of our show here today. But um, one of the things that I'm most passionate about and the whole reason why the company ever launched to begin with was because um, as a professional dog trainer, I really wanted to celebrate uh, the connection that I had with dogs and more importantly the connection that I saw other people were having with dogs and to do that in a creative way with products that just recreated the emotions that we all have around our dogs. However, I still train dogs and I have been training dogs for the past 18 plus years. I know, I started when I was born. I get it, but anyway, I um, have been training for quite some time and because I'm very taxed with my schedule and whatnot, I have chosen in the past five years to really hone in on the area that I feel um, is my area of expertise and that is in the area of puppy development. Um, my commitment has always been to build, help families build a relationship with their pets on trust and mutual respect with the objective that here's this puppy that they bring into the house, they want to spend the rest of their life with this puppy for as long as they possibly can. And the best way to do that is in a, is in a, is in a way where the, um, the, the family is fully aware, not only of what they're getting into, but of how to best work with this new bundle of fur that they love so much. And let's face it, when it comes to puppies, um, it gets a little crazy. I mean, there is a reason why God made them so flippin' cute. Because when you're ready to pull your hair out, they just look at you and tilt their head like, what? And you know that, um, you know, they're gonna be with you. But it is so much better if you train them right out of the gate. And that's really what my emphasis and focus has always been on. Um, so we're in for a treat because we actually have a special guest. Um, who came to the Dog is Good headquarters that we're going to do some uh, that we're going to demonstrate. But well, I want this to be participatory. So I'm going to ask you, let me see, I'm, I'm looking at all these different, I got phones, I got Instagram going on there, so great, but I'm also trying to see some of your comments on our laptop here. Um, so if you have questions or comments or input, please participate in our conversation. But I'm going to ask you this. Well, first, may, do you mind being on? Okay, so I'm going to introduce our lovely guest today. This is Christina. Kristen. Kristen, excuse me. Kristen and her little pup, Bodie, who is a 12-week-old Labradoodle. How adorable. Oh, my gosh. And, yes, he's very calm. Like, this would be very unusual, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, anyway, he's going to um, participate here in just a second. But I'm going to ask you some of the same questions that I ask my own clients when I first come into their home. So I know there's all these things that you love about your pup. And there's also things that you guys love about dogs. Oh, excuse me. We're live. We're always in, in, in action here. Okay, there's also things that um, you don't like about dogs. You guys out there have behaviors that you know you absolutely love, and then there's behaviors that you're not so crazy about. So I'm gonna ask you guys to tell me all the behaviors that if you were to see a dog exhibiting certain behaviors or you're thinking of certain behaviors, you would identify that dog as a bad dog, as a bad dog. So just tell me what typical behaviors, and you guys throw, throw them in there in the comments, like what are some of these behaviors that are bad, we, or we write out as bad? Uh, jumping on people. Okay, jumping. What else, that's great. <laughs> biting. Biting or nipping, right? Okay, biting, nipping, excellent. What else? Um, you know, not not following on the leash, pulling on the leash. Okay, pulling on the leash. Potty in the house. Pottying in the house, okay, excellent. All right, you guys start bringing them on. Uh, pulling on the leash, yep, one of the most common, pottying in the house. What else? 
Um, not not responding when you're if you're giving a command. Okay, so not <laughs> responding to cues. That's another thing. Go ahead. Oh wait, I've only had him for four weeks, right, so there's okay. not too many. Yeah, things. it's not about what he's doing, but just um, dogs in general. Dogs in general. What are the behaviors? Barking. What, barking. Okay. What else? Not sharing. Not sharing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any, stealing mom's food. Stealing food. Bending, Anything else? Bending, we got any bending, other good bending, ones bending. in here? Digging, that's another good one. Digging, okay, excellent. All right, so you guys kind of are getting it. She's, uh, Kristen said, and you guys have added to this, I'll just list them out. So we got the jumping, the barking, digging, pulling on leash, not listening to cues, um, pottying in the house. So kind of a general list, and you might be able to come up with a few more. Now tell me what you think a good dog is. Like, tell me the behaviors that you expect a good dog to exhibit. And again, it doesn't have to be with Brody, but just dogs in general. And you guys, uh, please pop in the comments as well. What are some of these good behaviors that we like to see? Um, listens. Okay, listens. Doesn't jump up on people when they come to the door. Okay, doesn't get jump up <laughs> on people. Um, does it bark? <laughs> I mean, at, you know, when he's not Okay, <laughs> not barking. <laughs> what else? Um, Potty trained. Potty trained. Goes, knows where to go. Can Let's walk see. on the leash. Can walk on the leash. Resource guarding. Okay, I think that's on the bad one. Resource guarding. That's good. We, Looking at some of these comments. We have a couple too. Behaves at the vet and in public. Yes. <laughs> Behaves yes. in public. Yeah. All right. Calm. Calm. Anything else? Friendly towards strangers and other dogs. Friendly towards strangers and other dogs. Excellent. Okay, and I'm just curious. I'm going to make one more column. Um, the smart dog. Like what are behaviors that when you see a dog doing them, you're like, oh my God, that dog is so smart. Responding to the owner. Okay, so responding to an owner. Excellent. What else? Um, we have sitting. Um, okay, sitting, nice. Giving paw. Giving a paw, excellent. <laughs> friendly to other dogs. And friendly to other dogs. Okay, great. Um, one of the things I know we're going to want to do during our time here, I'm just doing a little aside here, probably going to want to get Bodie a little bit of water, and I'm going to work him in breaks so he doesn't get too stressed out. Um, all right, so you guys have just listed three columns. The column that you call the bad dog, the jumping, the digging, the barking, the um, running away, the not listening to commands, the putting in the house, the digging, all those lovely things. Then you said the good dog, oh, the dog that sits, that you know greets people politely, that uh, doesn't pull on a leash. Um, knows where to go to the bathroom, et cetera, et cetera. And then the smart dog, and you guys are kind of getting on onto it, is they, they, you know, they might do tricks, they might um, listen extremely well to advanced commands, et cetera. So this is what I share with everybody when we're first getting together. And what really I do want you to understand, because when you start to work with your puppy, think about this. Of those three columns, which is the dog like into this world came this creature and which column do they truly belong in like who are they are they the bad dog as we've defined them the good dog as we've defined them or the smart dog as we've defined them I think they're all of them I mean <laughs> in essence in true essence oh they're the good dog and smart dog so they are he already knows everything that you want to teach him no I don't think he's inherently bad no he's not <laughs> That's right. He's, he is not inherently bad, but we label the behaviors we don't want as right. bad. But I want you to know this, that what we're about to do, if the essence of dog is a creature who digs, who barks to communicate, who digs for things it wants, who steals food because it's, you know, it's available or what if I don't have food later on, who barks to protect its territory, who comes to us with all these instinctive behaviors, and then we want to change that to all these other things that, does he know, with the exception of sit, because they always do that, do they know intuitively what to do, all these other behaviors that we're calling good behaviors? No. no. So in essence, we are about to de-dog the dog. Does that make sense, you guys? Are you with me on that? We are about to de-dog the dog. Anytime you bring a new puppy into your house, that's your objective, right? You want to, re you want to remove these behaviors that they are instinctively driven to engage in. Mm -hmm. 
replace them with behaviors they know nothing about, try to do it in a language that they don't understand, and expect perfection pretty quick, right? Yep. Okay, so that's pretty common. So I share this with you guys because it's what I share with all my clients when I first work with them. It helps to give you perspective. Would that be like so frustrating for you mm -hmm. if I was like, you were like a particular way and I'm like, no, I need you to do this, but I start saying it in gibberish or language you don't understand. Yep, sure. Okay, very much so. So one of the first things to understand when we're first working with a pup is to know, hey, this is who they are. And my job is to show up as the best teacher possible, understanding that I'm trying to replace what they want to do naturally with something they don't know. And that I'm mean, as their teacher. So I want you to look at yourself as not only, you can say yourself a dog mom, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Because <laughs> first, we're dog moms. But for a little bit, when you're working with him, could you also consider yourself his mentor, his trainer, his teacher? Sure. Okay. And when you come at it from that perspective, does that put you in a different position? Yeah. Okay. So when he potties in the house and you're trying to help him potty outside of the house and you get frustrated, what might be the conversation you have with yourself after our conversation here that helps you prepare him better to do the things that you want him to do? Uh, pay, pay more attention. Like maybe I need to get him out. Trying mm -hmm. to go outside sooner. Right. Um, you know, right. Because he had to go and I didn't okay. get to it. Soon Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So, from the training perspective, coming from a place where you ask yourself this question always What can I do as his teacher, as his mentor, as his trainer, whatever you want to call yourself? Because mm -hmm. you're not dog mom in that moment. Right. Okay. It, what can I do to set him up for success? Because I want to change him, not who he is, but how he acts. Mm -hmm. um, what can I do to set him up for success? And so the first thing you're going to do is look at the environment, right? And you're going to ask, and you're going to figure out what do I need to do to prevent him from having access to practice all the behaviors that I don't want him to do. So we'll address a couple of yours today because we're going to have limited time. But we'll figure that out. Like, well, okay, if we don't want him to jump, what can I do first and foremost? to prevent him from practicing that behavior while I am teaching him something completely new and showing him that this is the way we're going to make it happen. Okay, so that's a perspective that we're going to come from. The other piece is, um, and normally when I do this, my first appointment for the, I don't know, uh, I have a lot of trainers who, who are uh, fans of Dog is Good. I don't know about you guys, but my first consultation with a client is always about two hours. There's a lot of conversation that needs to go on. We need to talk about, okay, here's a pup that's at 12 weeks of age. Where are they developmentally? What can she expect? Um, she will be better prepared to know what to do in week 13 and 14, 15 and 16 if she knows exactly what to expect here. And how can I, as her trainer, set her up for success so when she hits those frustrating moments, she knows, oh, this is what Gila was saying was going to happen. Okay, I got this. And she works through those frustrating moments because that's really key. Um, so... My style of training is uh, I love using clicker training. I feel that because uh, we're going to work with him and teaching him some new things, but we're trying to talk to him so much, mm -hmm. I tend to talk a lot less. In fact, I almost don't talk at all. I tend to use just the clicker and conversation. So, are you familiar? Have you ever seen clicker? Heard yeah. clicker? Okay, yeah. so she's familiar with the clicker, and, and most of you, I'm just going to make the assumption are, but for those of you, the the 1%, like, you know, you're watching the airline movie, and they're like, for the 1%, I has no idea how to buckle their seatbelt. <laughs> for those of you who have <laughs> never used a clicker or heard of it, it's just a small device. It's an acoustic marker. It lets the animal know that in the second they just did something, that is exactly what you wanted them to do. And every time you click, they, they get a reward. They get a, typically their top reward, which usually is food. And that's the other thing, too, we'll talk about briefly uh, for just a second. Um, I'm going to ask you, okay. um, what's your favorite treat? Ice cream. Ice cream, okay. So let's say I invited you over to my house, and I said, Kristen, um, if you will wash the dishes from my dinner party, I will give you... Um, I got five different choices of ice cream that you could have uh, for dessert. Would you want to wash the dishes? 
Maybe. Okay. okay, so what is making that now? That's a great, great answer. What are you basing your decision on? I don't know how many dishes I have to wash. Okay, that's good. That's excellent. Like, what do I have to do to get the reward? That's a very good, valid point. What do I have to do to get the reward? Okay, so there's only like, okay, I'll, we'll, I'll address that later. But, and what would be another thought that you might take into account? Is it the kind of ice cream I like? The five options? I love it. <laughs> I did not prep her on this. Is it the kind of ice cream that I would like? Okay, what if it's all the flavors that I like in my, in my freezer and none of them that you like? She would not be motivated to move into action. So the objective with whatever reinforcement you're using has to be something that motivates the animal. It, you might think it's motivating for you. Love, praise, and affection is very motivating. I use it all the time, and I love it, and I love it because I selfishly get back lots of love and attention from my dog. Not selfishly, but you know what I'm saying. Like, it's a, it's a back and forth in, interaction. But there are times, I, trust me, where Bolo is like, lady, I would rather have a treat than all your love and attention and kisses, okay? Or I would rather have my kibble. So be very clear that even though you're their mentor or teacher, your other job is to determine what really motivates the animal into action. Now, whether you like it or not, most animals are motivated by food, okay? Especially dogs, especially labs, probably especially Labrador. Is he very food motivated? He is. Okay, yeah. not surprised. So we, uh, the click will equal a treat. Um, in this case, but it can also equal food, etc. And the other question that I often get from new puppy owners is, am I going to have to walk around with my clicker at all times and forever? And the answer is no. Um, this is a tool that I like to use to teach something new and then ultimately fade out of that. But will you ever stop rewarding your dog for doing things that you like? No. Okay, right. Because if we choose to remove what motivates the animal into action, Ultimately, that behavior starts to slide a little bit, disappear, become less solid, etc. So those are just some of the key things that um, we'll talk about. Now, um, let's introduce the clicker to him. Okay. And him yeah, we'll just put him down. Now I've just met B Bodie, and we're gonna bring him over here. Come here, Bodie. Come here, buddy. And I might have you put keep his leash on so I can okay. keep him within the um, the camera range here. Come here, Bodie. Hi, Bodie. And you're welcome to come bring him over here too. This is all new for him. Good boy. Sit. Give him a chance. Sit. Okay. Very nice. So I'm just gonna get him used to the clicker here for just a second. I'll have some treats. And you can drop a leash. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Good boy. So have you used a clicker at home? No. Okay, so he's just getting introduced to this right now. I'm just clicking. I don't have to hand deliver the treat. I can drop it on the ground. Good. Good boy. Yeah, good boy. some general introduction which is a click treat click treat click treat I don't really care what he's doing although I am clicking the sit no mm -hmm. did you hear me say sit yeah. okay no it did not say sit I'm imagining he might know that word by now because I'm sure you've used it but I could call it anything ultimately and very nice so now he went into the down <laughs> on his own he's a he's kind of a shy little guy not not too nervous, bit. but yeah. I can see. Like this is, if Bolo were here, she'd be bolting all over the place and <laughs> going crazy. But he's actually pretty calm and mellow, and I'm going to tell you, you're very lucky because <laughs> this is not, you know, the, the huge. I get it. You probably have the crazy puppies in the afternoon, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to keep getting him used to the clicker and used to me. And in the meantime, I'm going to ask answer just a couple questions that some of you did send in. 
Um, let's see. How do, how, I, oh, okay, say the name. Um, okay. We got a lot of good questions here, and feel free to put some in the comments, too. Yes, and when I'm getting close enough to the um, to the screen now, where my old eyes can actually see your comments, so <laughs> great uh, great advice, Wendy. Uh, very true. We'll ultimately put them on the slot machine program, so he will never know when he would get a reward for something that keeps the behavior nice and solid. Um, so <laughs> he is he's so cute. He's he's picked up Fola's little toy, and I do have some toys here too. So the. I'm gonna answer a question in a second, but I want to, while he's playing with the toy, I want to um, share with you, there's really, to me, um, three key areas that are the top priority when you're first, at, at this age right now. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, above anything, obviously, is your house training. We don't want you to like get totally irritated and have to <laughs> invest in your carpet and all that good stuff, so we'll talk about that. The second thing is proper and safe socialization. This is absolutely critical, and quite honestly, it's my most immediate area where I want you to focus. And then the third is um, bite inhibition, or teaching them how to use a soft mouth. Mm -hmm. So when you have a young puppy, eight weeks, feels like they had come to you, like they're totally trained, you're like telling your friends, I just got this new puppy, he's so good. I've got the best puppy in the world. And then at 10 weeks, you're starting to see, oh, he's still pretty good. And then suddenly 12 weeks sit, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, like who is this little cute creature here? Um, and that's when, you know, so much of, um, you're dealing with all the nipping and the potting and, um, you know, trying to get him well managed. So um, we're gonna address those three things. Okay. The questions, let me see. Um, let's just address the house training, because somebody asked Cassandra, asked about how do you get them to stop potting in the house? Now, if you have a puppy, believe it or not, this is actually pretty easy. And who do you think it takes 110% responsibility? Me. Obviously, <laughs> yes, you are the one. So really, we need to train you. So why don't you share with me what his, um, how that has been going with you, for you? Uh, it's been going pretty well. The rain, the rain has made it a little more challenging, but I typically try to just give him opportunities to go outside every time he gets up from playing with the toy, every time he gets up from laying down, every time he finishes eating or drinking water. Okay, um, excellent. And that's when I don't do that, that's when he has an accident. Right, excellent. Okay, so the onus is on us always, 100%. Um, how much space does he have in your house to roam around? A lot. I mean, if, if I'm home with him, he has a lot. Okay, so. I usually keep him where I am, but. And then you kind of have to. Okay, yeah. nothing's blocked off yet. Okay. Um, we're going to watch him because he might have to go out here shortly. You know, he's, well, he's playing. This is good. We're going to let him play for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> of course, all cameras turned to the puppy. <laughs> so great. Yeah, I got another one. I got a biscuit. Um, so, um, first and foremost, no free reign of puppies in the house, okay? That's number one. Um, so how do we keep them on a, in, ensure that we can prevent them from potting in the house? You got a lot of it right, quite honestly. And by the way, you guys, um, we live in Southern California and something unusual has happened this past <laughs> month. We've been getting like this wet stuff, tons of it. Like tons and tons. We don't even know what to do with it. People don't know how to drive. They've been talking about closing schools. No, I'm just joking. Uh, but I get it. And so, of course, all the people in the Midwest and the Northeast are like, girls, yeah. <laughs> we have no sympathy for you. I understand. Okay. Um, so, first and foremost, you are doing a lot of things right. You're, if any time the puppy is playing, uh, well, for any time they've, been, they've eaten or had some water, usually within five minutes mm -hmm. or so, they really do need to get out. And, and do their business. Um, or if they've been playing for 10, 15 minutes with a toy or chewing even on a bone, like you think they're all good because they're all quiet watching, chewing on a bone, and then suddenly you turn around and go, well, when did that happen? Right. Okay, so kind of keeping on, on track with that. And then the obvious of any time that they wake up, they need to go out. Um, so one of the ways, I'm just gonna ask you a lot of questions. Okay. And um, there's no 
there is a right answer, but it doesn't matter if you don't pick the right answer. Okay. I will share that with you ultimately. So when you are thinking from this perspective now, what can I do? What can I do to prevent him from having those little mini accidents? Just give me some ideas what might work for you. Um, I mean, keeping him contained into one area. Okay. Probably. Okay, so how would you do that? Um, I'd have to get some gates. Okay. To block his access. Okay, excellent. So that's one possibility. Some gating, crating um, opportunities. Um, and then just more opportunities to go out. Okay, excellent. More opportunities to go out. Now, when you have him in sort of, uh, if you were to have him in a contained space, let's say the kitchen, and you have him kind of engaged in something, but you're cooking, let's say, or you're doing those dishes that, you know, you're debating whether or not doing. <laughs> um, how could you still ensure that he might not potty, um, whoops, might not potty when you're not paying attention? Uh, I mean, I don't know. Okay. So I'm going to give you a couple tips on that. Okay. First, she has it totally right. Um, when, when you cannot watch your pup at all, like 100%, they should go into a nice small contained area. It could be their crate, it could be a pen, um, or it could be that they're tethered to you. So his leash or a lighter line, I like to use a lighter line, and quite honestly for a pup, mm -hmm. most of the pups that I've ever worked with, if I'm working with them full time, they're pretty much tethered to me. So I actually tie it to my belt loop. Um, if I or I wear a little fanny pack if I'm wearing my um, like Lululemon kind of get my my leisure my what do you call that my leisure wear leisure. yeah my athleisure look um, I will just uh, secure it to that so then they're right here because you know that there's something that they do before they actually potty yeah they get up and they're kind of smelling around and then that kind of alerts you mm -hmm. so that would be my suggestion is to have him more on a tether so when okay. you are in doing other things, like you're watching him, but you're not like, bam, I'm totally on you, right? So that would that would kind of help to alleviate that. Then in those moments when you really can't even do that, he really should just go into his crate. And it's good for him to be in his crate. It's a safe place, they like it, um, and so that's a good thing. And he can have, um, if you had a bone or something like that, if you were home, and it was a big thing that he could not break anything off or ingest, whatever. You could have that in there with him for a little bit until you came back after your shower or whatever it takes. Um, but please know that you would never leave anything in that crate with him that he could ingest ever, okay, okay. when you're not there. Mm -hmm. um, the regular scheduling is also helpful too. And so you can begin to track when um, he is potty. So if you're noticing like, wow, okay, about now he goes here and he goes here and he goes here and I notice after he's been playing with toys, it's about 10 minutes now. Um, you can kind of start tracking that and then that'll help keep you. And are you home all the time? No. Okay, so when you're not home, where is he? Um, so we just started going to daycare. Oh, perfect. So he's done that a couple times. Okay. Um, and then if he's not there, he's kind of been fenced off in a larger bathroom downstairs. Okay. He can't. It's room for his bed and toys. Okay. And, all right, perfect. So. May. I ask and suggest that you consider a crate. I have a crate. You do? Okay. Yeah, I was just concerned that he would be left in there longer than he could right. support without going to the bathroom, so that's okay. why. So I just go for a little while. He's okay, it's perfect. So the average um, expectation would be his age plus one. Mm -hmm. So at three months now, he could conceivably stay into in his crate for about four hours before okay. he really, really has to potty. This is, would be ensuring that he has had all of his physical and needs met mm -hmm. prior to being put in the crate. Mm -hmm. Not the idea, like we don't, you right. know, whatever, but if, if it had to be, if he could go that long, okay? Yeah. And what do you think he's doing anyway when you're not there? Laying down or playing with the toy? Right, he's sleeping pretty yeah. much, yeah, at his age, so here you go, buddy. Oops. Okay. So, uh, for those of you perfectionist trainers out there, I am fully aware my timing is off on my click. I'm trying to talk and do this at the same time. <laughs> Come here. Come here. Good boy. Okay. So, um, that's managing the house training. Okay. And um, it is. it can be a challenge. Now, when you uh, see an accident after the fact, what do you do? Uh, I just clean it up. I mean, it's not his fault. Right. <laughs> She's on it. That's right. She's just going to clean it up. There's nothing she can say. There is no reason to bring your dog over to ask them what the heck just happened here. They have no clue what you are doing. And um, yeah. 
But if you were to catch him when he's like doing that sniff thing and he's about to, what would be the best way for you to handle that? Well, I've typically just picked him up. Yeah. <laughs> and carried him outside. Yes. And so that is what you want to do. Yeah. It's also helpful if you can startle him a little bit and kind of like, I usually, you know, I'm like a, ah, you know, like, oh, no. oh sorry, no, no, no. <laughs> He's like, what did I do? I usually will make like a big noise, startle him, and scoop him up, put him outside, and then immediately turn, you know, I call it being Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, in that moment, I'm like, ah, and then turning it back into um, the niceties. So, um, all right, the second thing that you want to be cognizant of is the, the nipping. We all don't like the nipping. We want to teach them how to use a soft mouth. And um, puppies teach, yes, a good boy, you want a toy, yes. Um, puppies um, teach each other this, right? So the easiest way that I have ever done in helping with puppies is just to kind of act like one of those original puppies from this litter. And when those teeth touch you, um, it's a yelp, okay? It's a yelp, very loud, like I say, be the Academy Award performer <laughs> of yelping, and then just a, a removal of yourself from interaction. That's 60 seconds removal, so that he begins to make the connection of, hey, when I did that, she yelped, and then she ignored me for like 60 seconds. Like that, he doesn't want that. He wants me to like continue to engage with you. Mm -hmm. Now that's easy if the dog is kind of mellow and chill, but if you have like a little sharky guy, um, that's a completely different story. So one of the ways, let me ask you, what could be helpful in managing, while you're teaching him the nipping thing, um, helping to manage his help him not practice that like what would be um i've just been replacing it with a toy for right you are okay and place. that's exactly what you want to do so whenever you're interacting with your puppy you want to always have at least two or three things can you guys kick those over to me thanks so as i see the puppy approach i immediately have something i can put into his mouth and if he doesn't want that one like he didn't mm -hmm. He's a smart guy. He's going for the biscuit and not the um, and not the French fries. Bolo had French fries this morning. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And his mouth is on me right now, but it doesn't hurt. But I'm gonna do it. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll do it if he. Um, yeah. Now you're not gonna do it, right? Okay. Fries. Biscuit. A little bit healthier. Not much. Still carbs. Still carbs. Having a ball. Having a ball. The point being is you have stuff and um, you have things that you can put into his mouth immediately and you always want to have them available to you. And then the other thing is um, working outside of your personal space. So instead of playing with him like right here, right, I'm giving, I'm teaching him a little bit of personal space here. Like I love you and we're going to get into a phase where we're going to get all over each other but right now when you're nippy mouth, um, I don't want you jumping all over me okay. and nipping me. Okay, there's that. And then the proper and safe socialization, which I told you we touch on. So you're gonna hear conflicting things. You're gonna hear, don't take your pup anywhere, quarantine them completely until they've had all of their shots. And I understand the importance of that. We don't want our puppies to get sick, and I completely understand that. But there are so many ways to safely socialize your pup. Because let me ask you, what do you think socialization is? How do you define that? Uh, I mean, I, I think it could be a lot of different things, but just seeing a lot of different people and a lot of different dogs that mm -hmm. look different and that sound different, um, and then actually, you know, interacting with them. Yes. So, um, socialization is just the opportunity for our puppies to experience all these new and novel things and have some sort of positive experience in those moments. So. Um, it, different sounds, different different places, as you mentioned, different people, um, children, you know, the mailman, people wearing hats, whatever. There's just so many things that you're going to want him to be completely comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But if he wait, if you wait till this beautiful window of opportunity never closes fully, but it does go to here. Mm -hmm. When it gets to there, it's a lot harder. So getting him out and about. Um, and doing so safely. So um, you could put him in a wagon if you wanted to walk him down the sidewalk, right? You could go to a coffee shop. This is what I used to do. I loved, oh gosh, you know, I think about my life a few years ago before I was like working all the time. 
<laughs> and I used to love going to this coffee shop in my local town here in Seal Beach, and I would bring the puppies. I trained them all day long, and I had mats. And I picked them up, and I carried them to the mat, and they would learn to settle in public, and they were tethered to me, and I would have coffee and um, connect with people. And of course, would get, the puppies would get a lot of interaction because of the people that would come up. Now, that's mm -hmm. puppies, but it's also on a, on a road. So you've got sights and sounds and um, uh, the chance to be on a sidewalk, the chance to be on um, you know gravel, on different surfaces. So taking your puppies, out get them out of the four walls if that is your objective to have them a part of your life later on if you're going to be driving down to dog beach we have dog beaches here and dog parks i have a love-hate relationship with dog parks so I'll, that's a separate subject yeah. but dog beach so are you going to take him down and put him on the sand before he's had all his shots no come here Bodie. Bodie took off he's right he might you might want to check on <laughs> So he went to, to probably get some water, and I think we have a bowl there. So if you want to give him some, you can. Um, she would um, put him in the car, so he gets experience being in the car. Drive down to the beach, so he gets to smell the, the smell of the beach, the sounds of the ocean, etc. And she, his typical his breed um, is small enough that she could actually carry him down to the sand if she wanted, and put down a blanket and sit there, um, and then you know, move on with her day later on. Um, all right, so that takes care of, I mean, I'm, I'm just touching the surface and I appreciate if you guys are putting in comments. Um, yes, having dogs become neutral to the world around them. Let me see some more of the cutie pies. What are you saying? What are you saying? You got a cute pie right here. <laughs> I get you. Oh, questions. Okay, so let's see. Um, Okay, so we just went over. Bethany Klusman asked, how do I get my one-year-old pup to stop nibbling and biting on my fingers? Okay, so part of that is the same process that we just went through. It is, um, one, having al alternative things that your dog, that you can put into their mouth. Two would be to yelp and remove yourself from the situation. And part of the easiest way to do that when you have a one-year-old that might race after you when you try to go is to have them tethered to something. And as you're playing and engaging with them, um, if he nips, you yelp, you walk away and disappear for 30 seconds and then come back. And little by little, as you start to see that the, the dog is using a softer mouth and not um, nipping at you so much, um, you can begin to also put that on cue. You can then actually click and treat the soft mouth as well. So that's kind of a process there. Um, let's see, another question is, how do I stop, this is from Charlie, Luke, and Rusty. How do I stop a dog from barking at people and standing on his hind legs while barking at the people? Okay, so first you would wanna ask yourself, why is my dog barking at people? Is he barking because he's like, hey, I'm here, come play with me, I want you to be hanging out with me, or is he like, Bark, 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 get away, get away, get away. You're like, where, what's going on with that kind of bark? Like, you have to sort of know that first. I'm going to make the assumption here that it's a barking because the dog wants distance. The dog does not want you to come closer. So, the way that we would handle that is far, far, far enough away from what that dog views as a trigger. So, before it would start to bark, there is a point at which the, the dog sees something. It's far enough away it isn't barking yet, but it does see it, okay? That's where you want to play. That's your safe space. And what you want to start doing is, <laughs> come here, you. what you want to start doing is um, the moment the dog sees his trigger or the trigger, we want to um, immediately provide access to something it loves. And even better, if you've taught it a watch cue or some sort of focus or attention cue that you see the trigger, and you might say, Bodhi, watch, and then immediately start giving it access to the food. And little by little, what we start to do is move closer and closer and closer to the trigger and provide access to things that the dog loves in hopes of making an association. Oh, I see that thing that I didn't want, but wait a minute, every time I see that, now I get access to something I love. Yeah, bring it on. Let me, I have no, no problem anymore with that uh, person or whatever being there. So I hope that answers your question. These are, you know, I'm giving you quick answers to things that require some, um, some work. 
All right, so let's work this little guy. We're gonna start first with, what do you think would be the most, if you, if you were to learn nothing else but this one thing, <laughs> what would that be? Oh gosh. Um, I don't know, probably like sit, lay down, go to place or something. Okay. Like that. So, come here, Bodie. Bodie. All right, all right. Okay, I cannot teach him all those things right now, <laughs> right. Uh, but I certainly can. But there's one core behavior. Some of you guys out there, my trainers, what do you think is the number one, first and foremost thing that we must, must, must teach him before we can teach him anything else? Or this is at least what I do. Can't speak for everybody. Let's see. Are you getting any responses here? Mel or Wendy, if you're still on. Come, come okay. is a great one. But I can't get him to come if I don't have him looking at me first, right? So focus first. Come here, Bodie. Come here, Bodie. You can ha ha ha. Yeah. Get up here. Get up. Come on. Get a boy. Here he We're gonna have a potty accident here, sure. Yeah. I'm saying, I'm sure. Okay, so let me get started on this. So the first thing we want to do is teach him to watch, to look, or whatever you want to call it. Um, without him looking first, I can't get him to come, but come is the second thing that I do teach, especially a puppy, because they tend to come naturally, and it's one of the most difficult later on yeah. when he gets to a place where, you know, at 16 mm. weeks, he's like, mm, I don't know, like, I love you, but I'm pretty much digging <laughs> what's going on over here. Right. So, oh, come here, Bodie. Come here, Bodie. So let me just quietly start working with him like I would, and then I can get him focused on me. All right. Yeah, you know what we're up to, don't you? You get a few treats, get it all set up here. All righty. Okay. Ready? So you guys may not be able to see his eyes. I'm clicking his eye contact with me. Do you want to use the word watch or look? What would you say? Mm -hmm. okay. I tend to use watch. Okay. Okay. Bodhi, come here. Pop, 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 pop. But watch. Do you have some of your treats? This one in. Good sauce. Oh, yeah. This is good. Good stuff. All right. Speaking of treats, while well, I'm also going to have you using his regular food, there's something to be said for the best being soft, smelly, and chewy. Soft so you can break off small pieces because you can see how big this is. Yeah, that's too big. But this is great. So I can use one tree for an entire session. Okay, buddy, buddy. Good boy. Buddy. Buddy, watch. Again, I'm clicking the actual eye contact. He's not looking quite at me. Watch. And I don't expect him to stay seated on this wood floor, so I'm just looking for him to, buddy, watch. Good. So as he looks up and right into my eyes, I'm going to click. Now, I have the treat. I'm going to call his attention over here. And the moment he turns to me is when I'll click. So he's got a distraction. I'm not saying the cue, if you notice, mm -hmm. right? my hand so that was a little bit of a clue. Buddy, watch. Good. Do it again. Good. Okay. Good boy. Good kid. Okay. 
Now what I could do is put it out to the side and then just say Bodhi watch. <clears throat> Bodhi watch. Good. And you want to be quick because mm -hmm. you want to click it the moment it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to try? <laughs> We're going to go, I'll help you. So hold this in your left hand. Hold the treat in your left hand because you're right-handed, right? I'm left-handed. Okay. So uh, <laughs> you'll hold that in your right hand then. Okay. And you're going to cue with your left hand. Put the treat in there as well. What you're going to end up doing is um, you're going to cue with your left. The moment he looks up at you, you're going to cue with your left. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and the moment he looks up at you, okay. you will click, and then you're going to reach with your hand and take a small piece off mm -hmm. and give it to him. Okay. And you can even have that behind your back if you want to. But come stand in front of him. And what I'm going to do, because he's going to look at you, I'm going to tap my foot so he's not looking at you. Whoop. Up, up, up. Okay, turn around a little bit. Okay, I'll just stand here now. You cue him. Bodhi look. Bodhi look. Good. Treat. So we are going with look. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter to me. Whatever's going to work for you, though, is okay. Watch. Watch is fine. No, I, I, it <laughs> so it doesn't matter. So you pick which one you want. But you go ahead, and um, I'm going to keep getting his attention off of you, and you start using it. Bodhi watch. Bodhi watch. Click. Good. Excellent. Now. That was great timing. What I want you to do this time is when you cue him, if he doesn't respond right away, just make a little noise. Don't repeat the cue. Okay. Okay. Come here. And you can come closer, so you can move. Like, here we go. And he sees that, so I'm gonna. All right, now. What do you watch? Okay. So you want to be like you're the active one. You can okay. move around. You can, now you have to get him. <laughs> You can also end up standing on his leash as well, so he doesn't, um, you know, go off. But you are you are not static. Okay. You, you need to move like you're the active, you're the lead dancer in this whole routine. Okay. okay? And if he's not looking at you, that's when you can use okay. it. Buddy, watch. And you got a distraction. Hey. So get his attention right up to you, whether it's a snap or a. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead and treat him since we did click. And stand on the leash, and I'm going to remove the distractions. Look, look, look. <clears throat> Don't lure him with the treat. Yeah, there we go. Excellent. Okay. So let's get him focused in on you. So you're going to do a higher pitch. Buddy, watch. And your voice is going to go up, and you want to use that left hand to help with a physical cue. You can snap, you can make noise, anything to get his attention. Buddy, watch. Click. Good. Excellent. Now keep your thumb on that clicker. Okay. On the, yep. Okay. Left hand is all empty, right? Okay. And Q. Go to watch. So get down Go to watch. Lower. Left hand is watch. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to do five in a row very quickly. Okay. As soon as you get it to him, you're going to go right back to it. Okay. I'm going to demonstrate for you one more time. Very quick. Like that. I'm not hanging here. Buddy, watch. Good. See how I'm using my body to keep him engaged with me and how fast? Buddy, watch. Yep. Good boy. So the moment he looks away, I'm trying to re engage. I'll do one more. Buddy, watch. Yes. So it's very quick. All right. Okay. But you see how I use my body in there? Yeah. Okay, you do the same. Go right to it. Go Buddy, right watch. Oh. Good. Now you're going to go right into the next one. Get a little closer. Use your energy. Talk to him. Buddy, watch. Good. Excellent. Engage him. Move, move, move. Buddy, watch. Go right to it. If he doesn't respond, Buddy, watch. Right <laughs> hey. Watch. Click. Good. Good boy. Good. Excellent. Okay. Let me ask you. If this were a dance routine, who is the lead? Right. Okay, you are for sure. But who was the lead oh, here? He was. he was, right. So for you to uh, become that lead part, uh, player with him, you just need to move a little bit faster. And stay, see how close he is with me, the proximity? I'm just going to um, get his proximity back. 
And he probably has to go potty. So we're going to take a break here in just a second. In fact, why don't you go take mine? Because I can tell. We don't want to mess it up. Okay, we have questions. So go ahead and do you want to read me the questions? I am a theology. Yeah. How much treat do you replace a meal with a treat? Oh, yes. Uh, as far as treaties. So just like people, um, calories in, calories out. So we don't want to feed the dog all their food and then add on all these calories with treats. We want to be cognizant of how many treats they might be getting, which is why I like to use their actual kibble. So what I will share with Kristen when she comes back is uh, most people with their new puppies, they put their food down and then they feed their puppy and then they try to do training during the day. You should be in control of their resources and feeding time is the perfect opportunity to be doing a lot of the training and having them earn their meal as you're doing it. Um, now, it does require, if you're going to be splitting up that meal a little bit, to be able to stay on top of the house training component, but um, that's, that's really key. Um, you can also see, too, where understanding the dog's body language and energy. So you can see where I'm able to keep the dog a little closer, and she is uh, learning how to improve her skills in doing that, and that's just going to be practice. You know, what do I need to do to match my dog's energy and keep them engaged on me. But really, quite honestly, we pushed the pup a little bit too long and he did have to go potty. <laughs> All right, so that's part of the, that was part of it. Um, the other thing too is when training, you would do this in short spurts, so like two minutes at a time, and make it a game um, so that they wanna participate. Lots of times if I'm doing the watch thing early on with their food in the morning, like his meal, mm -hmm. I actually will, you know, watch, yes, and then I go throw the, I'll throw a couple kibbles down. And then they go and get it and they're running back. Um, and then it's watch, and again, and he's just turning and looking. So it doesn't have to be so static like we're doing here, but okay. more of a game. And I'll talk to you a little bit more okay. after we're done today. Okay, so some other questions. Um, we did the barking. Loose lead walking. Oh, here's a really good one. Uh, Nanny and company, what's the best and safest way to introduce a puppy to other dogs? Okay, excellent question because this happens all the time. So, uh, not all older dogs can appreciate the cuteness and adorable craziness of a young pup. So really, first and foremost, be cognizant of that. Most uh, be aware of the dog that um, is going to play with and engage with the pup. So my dog, Bolo, who most of you know, my yellow lab, She's totally fine, like she could care less. The puppy could be jumping all over her. She is not gonna do anything, really. She, at some point she might choose to play, but for the most part, she's probably just gonna ignore it. She isn't gonna discipline it to, uh, to get it to stop being crazy. But there are other dogs that just won't tolerate it. So in every situation, um, you wanna have the, pups, the puppy on leash. You don't wanna be behind the pup. Um, you want to be right next to the puppy and allow the dogs to greet as they're supposed to greet. You know, you want them to be able to do their smelling, engage in some general play, and then you want to, you know, separate them for a second and help to reduce any kind of excitement or energy that may go on. And then you'll be able to see, you know, how things are, are going there. But most older dogs will either tolerate or they just won't tolerate it. And um, you, you want to be, be aware of that. Are you feeling good? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, the ball is out of my reach. <laughs> Um, any other questions that you guys are popping in? Okay, do you have any particular questions? Oh goodness. Um, no, off the top of my head. We have, we have one more. Okay. Um, barking and pulling at a dog that's walking by. Barking and pulling at a dog that's walking by. Okay, again, that's going to start with that very first basic skill set. So the most important skill, in my opinion, is your ability to say your dog's name or the watch cue or look cue or whatever you typically have trained and that in an instant, no matter what, they look up at you. They look up at you. And um, once you get that trained, um, now you can add it to with triggers. So you want to always teach something new in a non-distracting environment and then take it into the real world. So if your dog is already currently doing this, you want to take a step back, teach those new skills and then start to work on those when those kinds of triggers are walking by. And I would also recommend stepping aside. If you see those triggers, you already know what your dog's gonna trigger, going back to that original question, what is it that I need to do as his teacher to make it almost impossible for him to practice that behavior so I can teach him 
a better response because you can't do both. You can't you can't be reactive yourself and trying to teach him something new. So um, if you have a a dog that barks and lunges at other dogs, you know, across the street, or you see another dog coming, you might have already been working on, you know, watch, and then, hey, with me, come over here. And you put enough distance between you and the trigger to actually work on a calm behavior, providing those treats and access to good things while that trigger is walking by, okay? That's how I do that. <laughs> He's going off He's with very toys. Interested. He's interested in dog is good. He might, we, he might have a new job here. <laughs> That's great. Okay, one more one more question. Um, fetching. Fetching, fetching. So fetching is interesting because you have some dogs that are natural fetchers and retrievers, right? And Bolo lives for that. I'm so lucky. Of course, she doesn't always want to give me the ball. That's part of her game. Like drop it and see if she if, see if she can grab it again before I get it. <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys have dogs like that, but um, fetching is um, you know something that you can teach it you know it depends on how important this is to you and really what the skill set is for the dog and if they're really interested in it too remember what's always fun for us may not be exactly which dog wants to be doing so um, take that into consideration but typically um, uh, and I had a Dalmatian lab that I did kind of have to teach to fetch and so it started close where I was close to her and uh, she, she did catch things she did like to catch things she didn't always want to bring it back so starting close bring it back and then right there and you can use a clicker if you want or you can just say a simple drop it and give a treat pick it up and do it again and start chunking some of these behaviors together um, versus trying to throw it and hope that they go get it so starting from short super short distance again going back to your original question you should always ask yourself what can I do to set my dog up for success to make it possible so super close super close being patient getting a little bit further a little bit further and then pulling all those pieces together. I toss it, they catch it, maybe I toss it off to the side, or maybe I put it down and teach a pickup, you know, how, however, whatever the different parts are. Breaking that down, teaching those pieces, and then putting it all together. So, all right, so we've been on for a long time, almost an hour, wow. And um, I will help you with a couple other little things. I didn't do a lot of like specific training. The things that I would teach in a very first session with a brand new puppy owner, uh, with any dog actually that has had no training quite honestly is uh, going over an understanding of you know who your puppy is as a pup mm -hmm. what their natural tendencies and behaviors are and what are the things that you can be doing to prevent him from practicing all those things that you don't want him to be doing right. and then what is it that you really want because this is the most important thing um, I think that m every family misses they are not clear on what they really want from their puppy they know what they don't want, but they're not clear on what they do want. So when you get home, um, I want you to think about what do I see my puppy doing when the doorbell rings? I know what you don't want it to do, but what do you see it doing? What do you see your puppy doing when you're cooking in the kitchen? What do you see your puppy doing when you're out on walks? What do you see your puppy doing when you have um, guests over or when you go to dog beach you, you know having clarity around what you actually want the dog to be doing in all those situations if your dog was perfectly trained in the vision that you had tell me what really would it be doing if I were to walk up to it with another dog what do you see because that's what you're going to end up training and that's what you have to start right from the get-go practicing uh, preventing it from practicing what you don't want and having clarity around what you do want in every scenario and then uh, understand that training is happening all the time, 100% of the time, right? 100% of the time. And since it's happening 100% of the time, either you're training or he's training. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they always train. They're really good trainers. So uh, keeping those things in mind, uh, going through the bite inhibition, proper and safe socialization, being patient, being loving, and you will end up having, as we all know as dog moms and dog dads, the best relationship ever, forever. Yes. So anyway, thanks you guys so much for watching, celebrating National Dog Training Month. Although I thought that was last month, but whatever. There's something about training this month too. <laughs> and it's my pleasure to uh, be able to do this. This is what I love so, so, so much. And thank you for all of uh, you out there who do the same work. Ow!
that's that little fine inhibition thing. Um, and uh, just keep doing all the great work that you are doing. And um, thank you for being a guest. Thank I appreciate you. that. Bye, guys. <laughs>